Hi, this is Brad Keithley, the Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 14th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment of the Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find, find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, instead of our usual top three, we run through what, in our opinion, is are the five most irresponsible fiscal bills this session. We start with the worst, HB 331, the oil and gas credit bond bill, and go from there. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Yep. Yep. We're going to do today the oxymoronic worst top five. Top five worst. I'm not sure. Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How are you? I am doing good. Let me uh, crank your volume down a little bit here. I'm trying to balance everything out. A little bit of a uh, little bit of an interesting morning this morning. All right. Um, so uh, that was the first I had heard about it. I had not heard about this. Uh, I had not heard about this uh, lawsuit until just early this morning. Uh, that could potentially be some good news for us if it puts the kibosh on it in the short term. Well, it it could. It it may be it may be a little bit too early. The law hasn't been signed yet, uh, and so uh, it's fairly easy to for the state to at least file an initial dismissal because it isn't. They're challenging a law that isn't a law yet. But but once the governor signs it, and, and probably the process of going through the dismissal, uh, once the governor signs it, it will be a good challenge, and and we'll be off to the races. Eric, uh, for for listeners who are interested, Eric wrote a piece in the Juno Empire uh, earlier this session a few weeks ago, uh, expressing his concern about the bill, uh, and certainly uh, Senator Wilikowski had expressed his concern about the constitutionality of the bill, um, uh, and and because of that, the legislature included a provision in the bill that said any challenges had to be filed within 120 days of of the uh, of the statute becoming law so um I, people contemplated this 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 challenge was going to come up um uh, eric certainly is a is a good plaintiff because of because of his interest in the case as you can see from the juno empire op-ed uh and uh, and as soon as the governor signs it we'll be off to the races in the lawsuit yeah no absolutely so that's good stuff uh so we'll 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 detail this as we get further in i don't want to derail your worst top five so let's <laughs> let's talk about i again i'm still trying to figure out what's the best phrasing for that it's the worst five bills in uh in in this legislative session and they are some doozies i mean I, there are some definitely uh i mean great we got done within 120 days but at the same time at what cost i guess is the question at this point so let's uh let's take it away where do you want where do you want to start on your worst top five here well, let's, let's let's just start with number one because that's that's what we were just talking about with the lawsuit. The worst to to me, the most fiscally irresponsible bill this session was HB three thirty one, which is the one that um, uh, creates uh, these these the, the, this bonding program for oil tax credits, so that the state can go out and borrow a bunch of money from Wall Street and other locations, get a bunch of money in hand, and then pay off. Uh, these all tax credits all at once, uh, but sticking Alaskans, mostly future Alaskans, the ones in the 2020, uh, with the bill for paying off these credits. It under the statute, these credits would have been paid off in roughly the next five years. The statute provides for uh, pro pro provides a mechanism to take a portion of the production tax revenues uh, each year 
uh, put them into a fund, and then use the fund to pay off the credits uh, as we go. Statutes always provided that. Uh, the statutes always provided that when production tax revenues were high, when we had oil, high oil prices and high uh, 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 production levels, that uh, we would pay off those credits fairly quickly. And, and the statute clearly provided that when production tax revenues went down, as we've seen, as we've experienced since 2014, when oil prices took a dive, uh, that the state uh, would pay on those credits slower. Uh, but it provided it, the, the statute provided a mechanism. Producers knew what it was. Statute provided a mechanism to pay out these credits. Instead of continuing out the statute, paying out the remaining credits over the next five or so years, uh, in accordance with the statute, in accordance with what the producers had agreed since the outset, uh, the state's now going to go out and borrow a bunch of money and, and pay off these producers. What, what that does, it does two things. One, it kicks the can down the road. Uh, to the next generation. Rather than this generation cleaning up its own mess, it pushes off those costs uh, to the next generation. So the ones who are really going to be hit hardest by this are the ones who are going to be the Alaskans who are going to be here in the 2020s. At, and, and those are the same ones that are going to experience increased costs coming from the pers TERS retirement program, the legislature having kicked those costs down the road to that time period also. So we're sort of doubling up on bad uh, for this time period. We've kicked these costs down into the 2020s and left it to, to those Alaskans to deal with. The other thing that the, the bill does is it increases the cost because right. you're going to be now paying interest. You're going to be paying interest on this debt. So the total cost of the program, total cost uh, is going to be somewhere in the billion dollar level, um, uh, but it's mostly going to be shoved uh, down to uh, these Alaskans in the 2020. Uh, time frame that are going to have to deal with it. And I think that that is really uh, the, the biggest thing that wasn't considered is what is coming down the road. I mean, it all looks it all looks good on paper, especially if you're using best case scenario situations, which I think is what's happening here. Uh, but the bottom line is that nobody seemed to really be considering when the bill was going to be coming due, what was going to be happening in 2030 and that's really where the rubber meets the road in this whole problem. Yeah, it is. It's. I mean, it, it, we've we've done this before, right? I mean, in in 2010 to 2014, the state way overspent, uh, uh, overspent the capital budget, and built spent way above the long term sustainable uh, revenue levels of the state. You could see the problem we're in right now coming as the state did that. Uh, and when we hit the when we hit the oil crisis, when we hit the the, the price drop in oil. Uh, uh, it's clear it was clear that the problem, the the good times, the party that we'd had uh, as a state from 2010 to 2014 in terms of state spending, the bill for that was going to come due uh, in the in the mid to late uh, 20 teens. And 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 this generation of Alaskans, the ones who are here now, are paying the bill for. That, that party that they have between 2010 and 2014, and we're paying it in terms of largely reduced PFD uh, uh, payments, as well as to some degree reduced state services. But but mostly we're paying for it in terms of largely uh, reduced PFD payments. You can now see, I mean, sitting here today, you can see that we've now done this now to the 2020 generation. We did it before with PERS and TERS. That's already stacked on them. But now you can see with this bill, HB 331, that we've done it again to the next generation uh, by shifting these costs down the road, shifting and adding to these uh, costs that the next generation is going to have to pay. So just like in 2014 or 2010 to 2014, when you could see what we were doing uh, to, to future Alaskans, we're sitting here right now seeing that we're doing the same thing to Alaskans in the 2020s. But this legislature didn't care. I mean, it, what's really sort of amazing is members of this legislature have called out uh, uh, for as being irresponsible those who were here from 2010 to 2014 that overspent. Uh, and they've said, oh, we shouldn't have done that. We should have had different programs. We shouldn't have added all these Medicaid programs. We shouldn't have had all this capital spending. You know, that's what's really caused this situation now. And, and then they go on and say, we'll never, we will never do that. We're the fiscally responsible ones. We're the ones that are going to get it under control. And yet they're the very ones 
that just voted for HB 331 and has, and has done the same thing to Alaskans that are going to be here um, in the in the 2020s. It's, I, you know, if if we didn't have that background, maybe you could say, okay, they don't know what they're doing, and 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 you sort of give them a small pass, but they know clearly what they're doing. They know clearly what happened to this generation. Uh, when we overspent from 2010 to 2014, now we clearly see uh, the consequences of those sorts of decisions. So th- they don't get a pass. I mean, they're 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 intentionally kicking these costs and adding to these costs down the road for the generations of Alaskans that are 20 that are coming here in 2020, knowing good and well what we've already done to them with the PERS and TERS costs, uh, kicking those costs down into in, down into that. Uh, uh, that time period, and and I just think it's uh, it, it is to me the most fiscally irresponsible thing this legislature's done. It they're they're trying to they're trying to continue the party for some for those who receive these credits. They're trying to make it a better party right. by by giving them these credits early. But it's at it's clearly at the expense of Alaskans who are going to be here in the 2020s. And what and what's the justification? Do you think? I mean, some of these stalwarts that found religion and did all this kind of stuff. What do you think is the, you know, what's their justification either to themselves or their constituencies as to why they would do this and again kick this can down the road in such an obvious way? Well, the, what I've heard are two things, two defenses. We owed the money to the producers. And yeah, it's too bad we had to do this, but we owed the money to the producers. Well, that's just wrong. We didn't. I mean, the, clear, the current statute, the statute under which the producers signed up in the, for, this, for this program from 2007 on, that statute was absolutely clear about how these things were going to be paid. And, and, and when production tax revenues were high, they were going to get paid more. When production tax revenues were low, they were going to get paid less. The, the, the governor had in front of them the payment schedule on the current statute. Um, and, and so they, some of them will say, well, we owed the money now. Well, we didn't, the statute clearly provided that we didn't. So what's your, what's your defense, uh, to that? We didn't owe the money now statute right. statute provided that producers had signed up under that old statute, right? We owed the money, the second, but we owed the money on the statutory schedule that was there. Absolutely. Right. right it's right. like saying it's the, it's the equivalent of saying, I've got a five-year lease on, on my house, right? And it provides for a lease payments every month uh, in connection with that lease. And it's the equivalent of saying of someone saying, oh, no, you owe all that money now. You owe the, the entire five years, uh, uh, five years payment schedule, all the lease payments right now. And that's – I don't. I mean, I signed a contract. I signed right, a contract right. that says I owe it. I owe those lease payments on a monthly basis. The producers entered into a program that had – the, the 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 repayment schedule written into written into the statute. I I don't owe the five years lease payments all at once. We didn't owe the producers all those payments all at once. Right, right. And this is a Harold says the bonding idea is from the same governor, Bill Walker, who doesn't understand the tremendous negative economic impact of cutting the PFD. So. This seems to be from that same economic school of thought, which is we're going to do whatever we can to, uh, to you know, make sure the government's propped up while everybody else is eating it in the dirt. Michael, I would, I would, you know, I agree that this is this proposal came from the governor, and it is, uh, it's, it's, it's partially the governor's fault. But, but this proposal passed the House and right. the Senate yep. with Republican votes. Yep, and the the margin the margin of victory in the House was four uh, Republicans from the Matsu who otherwise claimed to be you know fiscal conservatives. Uh, we're not going to do anything that hurts Alaskans. We're going to pay our bills when they're due. Uh, we should pay the PFD because it's due under the statute. Uh, we should we should adhere to these statutes. It's four. Uh, 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 Republicans from the Matsu in the House who were the margin of victory uh, on this bill. So yes, the governor, the governor deserves some of the blame uh, sure. for this bill, certainly. Uh, but but this th- the blame is broader than that. It it bleeds over into the Republicans um, uh, in the House and specifically who claim to be fi- and specifically those four who were the most conservative, the last bastion of kind of smaller government discussion and thought anyway heretofore but now have fully embraced this idea that 
we have to give to to you know we have to give to make it right. Yeah, and it, and it leaves you with it leaves you with this impression. Uh, frankly, looking at that vote, looking at this bill, it leaves you with the impression that the Democrats will spend too much when it's K through 12, when it's the university, when it's uh, when it's health and human services, Medicaid. They will spend too much uh, on those programs. But the Republicans who claim that they were that they were never going to do that, they will spend too much uh, when it's the oil industry involved. Uh, that they will go out of their way. To, to overspend, to do things like this bonding program, to generate additional money uh, and spend too much and push the, uh, uh, kick the can down the road to future Alaskans, uh, kick and increase the can down the road to future Alaskans when it's, when it's the old companies involved. And that's a, that, that leaves a very bad taste in my mouth. I mean, I, 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 I come from the oil industry. I you know, defended SB 21, the revision of the oil tax credits. I would do it again today uh, if, if, we, if we had the same issue uh, once, I mean, yeah. When I first started coming on this program, people told you that I was too aligned with the oil industry. You were going to get a biased <laughs> view uh, uh, about the oil industry. I, but this is wrong. Excuse me. This, this is this this bailout that we're doing uh, for these certain companies uh, is wrong and fiscal mismanagement. And the Republicans are as deep into it as as are the Democrats. So HB three thirty one, the worst bill in the legislature this session, probably, quite honestly, probably since the Persian Turs debacle of kicking that can down the road. And on top of it, by the way, uh, which uh, you haven't mentioned so far, but we looked at what the what are the cuts to the budget this year, and part of that has been the annual contribution requirements to various funds, and one of them that was short-funded was also the Persenters. So we've already increased the unfunded li- liability of the retirement this year more on top of everything else as a way to make it look like we're saving money by just not fully funding our obligations to these things. Yeah, and Persenters has one. I mean, it, th- this isn't on the top five, but it'll be on the top five as we move into the into the next decade, certainly. Persenters has one other really bad uh, 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 aspect to it that's going to come back to haunt uh, Alaskans uh, late in this decade uh, and and through the 2020s, and that is that the that the legislature and the Alaska Retirement Management Board, uh, which governs, which looks out for PERS and TERS, have assumed that the PERS and TERS fund, the endowment that's been set up for PERS and TERS, is going to earn an eight percent return Jeez. on an annual on a consistent <laughs> annual basis. And that that earnings level is going to come back into the fund, and it's going to soften, reduce the amount of contribution that has to be made by the state by the state fund. Well, person tourist hasn't earned eight percent in a while, um, and if you look at other states when they look at their funds, some of them have reduced that assumption about future earnings levels or future return rates to down to six percent. And when you look at at the, the the fiscal analysts out there like Moody's and Sanders and Poor's, they're all talking about using returns that are that start with a start with a six. So not only are we underfunding uh, per, the contributions to PERS and TERS currently, this problem is going to get worse. Right. The 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 escalation that we see hitting in the in the mid 2020s already uh, under the statute. Uh, are already under the program is going to get worse as that as as we fail to hit that eight percent return level. You can see that. I mean that that goes back to three thirty one. You can see that coming. You can see that hitting Alaskans in the mid twenty twenties and piling HB three thirty one, piling the these these tax credit responsibilities on top of that. Uh, is just uh, that's just mismanagement by by the legislature. I mean, you're just you're just saying uh, too bad. Those of you who are here in the 2020s, we're setting up a, such a scenario in which if you still have a PFD at that time, we're going to have to take even more of it, and we're probably going to have to tax you too to have enough revenues uh, to be able to survive that. Now, Senator Shower made a speech on the floor when 331 was up on the floor that I thought was thought was outstanding. Uh, it, it didn't convince anybody. I mean, heck, even Shelley Hughes voted for 331. Uh, but Senator Shower really outlined what I think are, are what we're doing to the next generation, and it's just, uh, it, it's just, it's just, it's irresponsible. 
Um, and and three thirty one plays a big role in that. Can we let's sidebar for just a second before we move on to the to to the next top five? Because because I think you've hit on something here that is something that it folds into three thirty one, but also folds into a lot of the other stuff that we talked about. You talked about the arm board. And their assumptive, their assumptive numbers that basically say they're going to make an 8% return. We've talked about that for the permanent fund and other things where they've said similar things. You know, it's going to be an 8% when we were nowhere near 8%. And this state historically has had a habit of betting on the best case scenario in a lot of situations. 331 is a prime example. Ed King's numbers on 331 is a prime example. Again, betting that they were going to save and invest the savings that they would make by bonding this money when we all know that their actions in the past is going to inform the future. They're going to spend it. We know that an 8% return is not really viable in the long term. Why are we doing this? Why are we not? I mean, to me, if I was going to make this and bet on investments, I would be as conservative as possible, saying maybe even that we're going to expect a 5% return, even though maybe 6 is a better number, because it gives us that hedge and that buffer to know that if something happens, you know, I'm the guy that bets on the worst case scenario, or at least a conservative scenario, so that we can do it. Why do we continue to do this and put ourselves at risk in all these different ways for the future well there's 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 two things going on one in, in my opinion one is that current legislators don't want to bite the bullet and and pay for those costs currently if they can figure out a way to kick the can down the road to the next generation they do it telling themselves oh the future will be better than than now uh and they'll be able to the the future will be able to handle it better so one of it is trying to minimize uh, uh, current costs. The other, uh, frankly, is is they want to minimize cur- minimize current costs on these things so that they can uh, justify increased spending uh, on other things, so that they can keep the K through 12, the the BSA at a relatively high level. They can add these bumps. We added 20 million this year, 30 million next year, uh, at least uh, at, at least 30 million next year to uh, to K through 12. Uh, school funding. So if you keep costs down on current things like uh, the oil tax credit program, you can you can expand spending. You still have the same amount of revenue, right? So you can expand spending uh, on other things uh, and and feel better about that. Um, and so it's a, it's a combination of those two. I want to I want to you know tell people that 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 we're keeping spending down in this generation. One way to do that is to kick it to the next. And the other is I want to tell people that I'm spending things the way they want me to spend it currently, so I can inke- I can increase uh, uh, K through 12 funding uh, without people being as as upset about it because I've kept costs down on this other program. Well, it's frustrating to say the least, but that's uh, where we're at right now. All right. So that was that the totality of the of the number one worst bill out there. It is. It is. It's a. It's a. It. 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 it, it I guess. I guess it is. It is the the con, the, the, the 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 addition of kicking the can down to the road of the next generation and adding costs to the next generation in significant part because we aren't saving. Ed, you mentioned Ed King. Ed King and I went through a couple of. Uh, back and forth uh, pieces that we did on this subject. Ed's point was, well, if we reduce the costs uh, of the program, took the savings between what we would have paid, the $180 million that, that we would have paid under the statute this year and the $25 million that we're paying on interest expense this year, if we would have we would have saved that roughly $155 million, put it into savings um, and let it generate returns, invested it, let it generate returns, we sort of pay, we sort of pay for the program. Um, pay for, pay for these costs down the road because we'd have generated all these additional returns. Well, the fact is the legislature didn't do that. Ed, in the in the last set of go back and forth between Ed and I, we agreed that the legislature would need to do something to to formally protect those savings. Ed had a number of suggestions in the last piece he did uh, about how they could do that, putting money, you know, separate, segregating the money in the permanent fund or or putting it into the Alaska Capital Management. Uh, corporation, an existing corporation that we have, investment fund that we have, uh, legislature did none of that, right. and 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 instead, you you can you can sort of clearly see line of sight between the reduction that 155 million dollar reduction that we have in what otherwise would have been spent on 
uh, on oil and gas tax credits and the $20 million bump and other bumps uh, on on other programs, K through 12 uh, and other programs out there. Sort of a bunch of it shows up in the in the House version of the Capitol bill. So, um, yeah, it's it's I mean, we're 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 we have clearly locked in on 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 this on on making 331 a big problem for the next generation and we clearly didn't do the things that might have mitigated uh, mitigated that risk right and and king i saw in one of his pieces basically admits that if we don't save the money we're toast i mean he basically yeah. admits this says that this is this what happens it's going to be bad so um all right let's move on to item number two on your most uh, five most fiscally irresponsible votes this season uh what is number two on your list all right. So number two is uh, is the is the House decision to rescind uh, uh, an amendment they that they had adopted at one point, restoring the full PFD to the FY 2019 operating budget. As the as the operating budget was on the floor, uh, and this is this is the budget now through which the legislature is funding the PFD. When the operating budget came to the floor, House Finance had proposed a significant cut. Uh, in the PFD, I think maybe down to twelve hundred dollars is what came to the floor. Right. Um, and then uh, through a, so through a series of votes, the House sort of surprising themselves, I think, uh, voted to restore the full PFD to go back up to the twenty three, twenty four, twenty five hundred dollars, whatever the full PFD would have been, um, uh, and voted voted to do that. Immediately, the Speaker. <laughs> adjourns the house they don't come back for a couple of days uh and when they come back uh there's a vote uh uh people reverse their votes a move to rescind there's a motion to rescind the vote approving the full pfd uh and then reversing that and then ultimately cutting the pfd uh down to the sixteen hundred dollars <laughs> dollar level that they, that they finally approved that vote uh rescinding the vote the surprise vote somewhat surprise vote where they voted to maintain the PFD, that vote rescinding the PFD is, is number two on the list because it took money out of the private sector. It increased uh, the adverse impact uh, on the overall Alaska economy and and jobs, uh, and basically uh, 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 brought brought back in all of the bad things that cutting the PFD does to the overall economy uh, and Alaska families. There was a moment in time where it looked like we might be on the road or at least early on the road to a full PFD. Uh, and then this vote cut it back and, and triggered all of the, uh, all of the bad things. You know, it was funny because that it was such a surprise. It seemed like leadership was like, what the actual hell just happened. And, uh, again, gaveling out to try and figure out what just happened and then going back and whacking everybody's pee pee and then saying, you will do what we say or else that was kind of the feeling that I got during that time frame, like, whoa, what just happened? Um, somebody was actually voting for the for the constituency. What, you know, we can't have that, I think, was kind of the general consensus when it was all said and done. Yeah, and it was and it was leadership. I mean, Speaker Edgman, Bryce Edgman, voted it made, voted for the full PFD. So you sort of with Chris Tuck, the majority leader, voted for the full PFD uh, uh Gabby Ledoux, the, the rules chair, voted for the full PFD. Uh, 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 Neil Foster, the co-chair of House Finance, voted for the full PFD. So it's leadership right. that was part of the vote to maintain the full PFD. And then they sort of saw the the net result of that and uh, and and then backed off. But that that when when people talk about where when did we lose the PFD this session? That vote is when we lost the PFD, and, and so it's number two on the list. And, of course, losing the PFD or the full PFD has the largest adverse impact on the private economy and Alaska citizens of anything else that they could have done. Um, and even though I know that it, according to Kathy Giesel, ICER is the Institute of socialistic whatever it was that she decided to call them <laughs> and then she said that brad keithley moved to oregon um you know I, I i i just you know the the disdain that these people seem to have for those of us that are fighting this battle brad is is amazing to me yeah oregon i i went to a concert in oregon once I, yeah yeah but i, but I can't 
but but I came home and I still live here. So I, I I'm not sure where that one came from. Well, but, but um, this is the I, thing. This is they they treat anybody that has counter arguments that has a counter belief to them. It is almost that ad hominem kind of thing. You know, ICER becomes instead of the Institute of Socioeconomic Research, it becomes the Institute of Socialist Propaganda and whatever. Uh, they just don't believe it. They believe, you know, it's it's their co- they're looking for their confirmation bias. Anything that creates cognitive dissonance that must be attacked, must be discredited because their way is the only way. In the, and we saw the same thing in the Breeze Law Bill. How dare you come down here and tell us how to govern in Juneau? We're in charge. You're just the citizens. Get back on an airplane and get out of here. That's kind of the reaction of these people, and that's a problem. Yeah. The the the, the economic analysis. Uh, so uh, yes, Geisel, Senator Geisel tried to discredit uh, by by you know using coming up with a what she thought was a funny name for for ICER. The problem is the Senate. Uh, who are who have been particularly adamant on cutting the PFD never came up with their own economic research. I mean, if, if to this day, the analysis by ICER is the only economic research out there uh, uh, of of what the impact on the overall state is of cutting the PFD. No one ever came up with an alternate economic analysis that said, oh, if you make these assumptions, uh, uh, doing something else like. Uh, you know, funding through a flat tax or, or, or these or the other alternatives is worse. No one ever came up with that. Right. So the only economic analysis analysis out there uh, is is the one from ICER. And yeah, they can try to deride it, but it's the only one that's out there. So e- either either you 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 believe in fairy. I mean, I guess you must believe in fairy tales. You must believe in you know something in the mist mist out there because they have no support. Uh, to show that that any other uh, uh, step they could have taken has a has a larger adverse impact than uh, than cutting the PFD. All right, motion to rescind Amendment Number One on House Bill Two Eighty Six, which would restore the PFD, is your number two, which leads us on to number three of the five most ir- uh, fiscally irresponsible votes this season. Well. The overall vote on HB 286, which is the, the operating budget, the FY 2019 operating budget that they voted out, is, is number three on the list. Um, I guess the, the, the PFD vote's a subset of that, but, but as importantly, the larger bill, voting out the larger bill. You and others uh, listening will remember last year when the Senate, particularly Senator Hoffman and Senator McKinnon, said – the cuts we make last year are, are the first of several cuts we're going to make. We're going to glide this spending down. We're going to reduce spending further. Uh, we're going to cut program, go in and look at programs, and we're going to get Alaska uh, in better fiscal shape. Well, they didn't. Most of the cuts last year were sort of fake cuts that were, that were, that were created by uh, shifting funding from one thing to another so that you can right. say that UGF, un- unrestricted general fund spending, was down. Um, uh, and, but they said, you know, we're going to make real cuts next year. You can go back and find those quotes, $200, $300 million uh, in additional spending cuts were, were coming up on the board. You heard, when we finally got to this year, you heard none of that. None of that. There were, were, there were no programs uh, in the operating budget uh, the drive the operating budget that were really looked at hard. There was no looking at the BSA that drives the K through 12. A lot, a lot of the K through 12 budget. Nobody went in and looked at the Medicaid programs to see if there were some optional Medicaid programs that could be uh, uh, that that Alaska could live without, like other states do. Uh, there was no looking at uh, other programs in in health and human services. Uh, or even elsewhere in the government to try to find additional cost savings. They just sort of, they just sort of took the, 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 the programs in place and kept them in place. And you can see, we did an analysis you can find on our uh, Facebook page at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can see that they kept, that they, that they actually increased funding uh, over uh, FY uh, uh, 2018. Yeah. When you exclude, uh, when, when, you, when you look at the operating budget, the operating budget in FY 2018 went from $5.18 billion, which they said, that's total general funds, which they said they were going to reduce further. It went from that to 5.25. So not only did they not reduce it, uh, they, allowed the, they allowed the cost 
of the programs to, to creep up. Even if you look at unrestricted general funds, the FY 2018 uh, unrestricted general fund was 4.22 uh, billion. Uh, the final uh, is 4.39 billion. So right. number three on our list is not following up uh, not following up on the promises made last year to go in and uh, do uh, additional reductions um, in in spending that that the legislature had promised the previous year. Now, if you look at it, and Brad, I have your I have your graph up on the screen right now for folks to take a look at. But you could you could take a look at it right now, and you could see you know exactly. And here's where they use the gimmickry, the 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 voodoo economics, where they. They hide stuff in designated general funds, and then they say, oh, we've cut this, we've cut that. We're lower than where we were at. We do all this other kind of stuff. But when you look at the actual outflow, the actual total outflow, you could see that we are over a billion dollars more than we were last year. And in fact, I saw some analysis last night with some of the other stuff that said almost one and a half billion dollars more than we were in fiscal year 2018, which will end in about five weeks. This is, I mean, this is insane. I mean, we are in a recession, the longest running recession, the deepest, highest unemployment rate. Alaskans are suffering. We're having an outflow of citizens from the state, and they are spending 21% plus more than they were last year. But we couldn't find another thing to cut, they say. Yeah. A lot of that's driven. I mean, a lot a, a significant part of that is driven by HB 331, the one where we're borrowing a bunch of money and we're just going to immediately hand it out uh, to these uh, on these oil and gas tax credits. But even if you take out the effect of 331, which is really what I'm trying to get at in my in my third worst, even if you take out the effect of 331, you can see that that, that spending has increased along the line. Look, looking at that chart, You've got on the uh, you've got on the page, FY 2018, which we've got on the left hand side, total uh, operating budget, uh, UGF and DGF combines 5.18 billion. Uh, that's the number that everybody that that you have all these quotes from last year saying we're going to dig in, we're going to reduce that further, another 200 to 300 million dollars in reductions. And then you look at the final out to the right hand column. That's the final for FY 2019, 5.25 billion dollars, no reductions, and in fact, in fact, an increase. Uh, you can also see why I use general funds as opposed to unrestricted general funds. In the in the right. second column or the second row down, you see unrestricted general funds. And if you look at 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 the governor's proposed, the House and the Senate, those are all you know higher numbers by some three hundred million dollars uh, than than UGF and FY 2018. But surprisingly, then when you get out to final. Uh, which is which is what came out of the conference committee. Suddenly, the UGF number is about a hundred million dollars less than the Senate's number, is less than the House, and less than the governor's proposed. How did they do that? <laughs> well, you look at the D, you look at the DGF number. It's, what, it's why I've got it there, and the DGF number pops up. So they will they will now campaign and tell you, oh, we got UGF spending down. You know, we the conference committee took it down further from what anybody proposed. It's 170 million more than FY 2018, but it didn't skyrocket. Well, when you look at the combination of UGF and DGF, you find that in fact uh, it 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 is higher than uh, than than uh, FY 2018 levels. So right. it's I, it, there, there's there's just a huge disconnect between what they said last year they were going to do and the additional savings they were going to find. Um, and, and, and what they delivered out. I mean, the Senate, the Senate's the one that made all these statements about, we're going to find 200 to $300 million more in savings. We're going this is going to be a process. We're going to get spending down over this period of time. And then you look at their numbers, um, and, and there's no reduction in it. I mean, it's 5.18, uh, combined general fund to 5.18 in FY 2018, no re reduction in it. And by the time they go through the, the conference committee and, and work through things with the house, it goes up another, um, uh, $70 million to 5.25. Well, and I love the political economics because again, 4.22 UGF in 2018, Everybody else proposes ones that are higher. We end up with a 4.39, which is higher than 4.22. And yet everybody claims it's a cut because what it is is a cut to the increase. I mean, right? I mean, that's that's the that's the verbiage that they use. Look, we cut it. It was a cut, not to the original number, but it was a cut to the increase, so we call it a cut. And and this is the kind of 
sorcery and shell games that the average person is tired of, is sick of. But you've got it. But we've got to have programs like this, and candidates have got to be out there armed to be able to talk about this, or else you have senators like Peter Machecki who just goes out and says, "We cut," and and everybody believes it. It's like three thirty one. People are going out and saying, "We saved we saved Alaskans money." No, you didn't. You you piled on a bunch of money on on future generations. How can you say you saved money? But you know they say it, uh, and and people sort of accept it, and so. We need we need this analysis. Candidates need to understand this to be able to go back in and say you didn't cut it. it you, you you didn't cut it anywhere near what you said you were going to do last year. Uh, it was five point one eight last year and it's five point two five that this year. That's an increase by anybody's analysis. Right. What what Machecki and other what Machecki and and Costello and others will say is well go back and look at twenty fifteen, and and we cut it from twenty fifteen. Well you didn't make these statements last year about cutting it from the 2015 number you said we were on a downward glide path you said we the the, the last year we were going to make cuts and we were going to make even more uh in the following year and you didn't do it let's look at fy 2018 let's look right. at what comes out uh this year so to me hb 286 the 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 operating uh, uh budget uh is is number three on the list because they didn't follow through on the promises they made last year. They didn't cut it. They didn't go back and look at programs. Um, uh, they didn't, you know, reanalyze sort of the the fixed costs of these programs that we, that we've got going on. Uh, they just left it. They, they they increased it instead of instead of even reducing it a little bit. All right, that's three of five. Let's move on to number four. Number four is SB twenty six. That is. Uh, the use of permanent fund earnings, that's the, the bill that finally came out of conference committee. Um, SB 26 was far and away the the early odds-on likeliest uh, worst bill of this session uh, because the, S, the version of SB 26 that was sitting in the conference committee permanently cut the PFD. Um, it reduced it from 50% down to uh, the House had it at 33 percent. The Senate had it t- at 25 percent. And that sort of permanent reduction in the PFD would have long term adverse impacts uh, on the overall Alaska economy and Alaska family. So it was it was the odds on favorite uh, to win uh, the worst five would be number one on the worst five. What happened in the conference committee uh, at the at the very end uh, is they is they kept the portion related to the POMV draw. So they so they've limited the amount of money that can be drawn out of the permanent fund. Um, it's it's really just a different way of doing inflation proofing, and frankly, that part of it, the POMV, I'm fine with. But what they did then was they kept the current PFD statute in place. They didn't change the 50/50. They didn't even change the method of calculating uh, the PFD. And so what they've set up is, is a situation in which, just to use just to use uh, use numbers for for uh, for e- e- exemplary purposes, they, they they created a box in which you're going to be able to draw out ten units, a uh, uh, billion dollars, two billion dollars a year uh, through the POMV draw. Let's just say it's ten units, and 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 they've created a situation in which, by keeping the current PFD statute, six of those units are supposed to go to the PFD, sixty percent supposed to go to the PFD, uh, and four of those units are available for government. Government. Well, we know. Because of because you can look at projections, the government says it's going to need more than those than that forty percent uh, of the POMV draw. So they've just created a situation next year and in subsequent years with this statute that's just not going to work. Right. It's not. It's it's not that it's changed the PFD st- statute and 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 it's bad for that reason. They've just created an unworkable situation in another way. They've just kicked the can down the road. Uh, to future legislatures, uh, legislators to try to deal with this, and it's it's an unworkable situation. It's not as bad as the reason it's not number one is because it doesn't permanently change the PFD percentage, uh, but it's number it's still on the top five because it leaves a situation in which the PFD is clearly at risk because it's going to be competing with government for uh, for whatever funds are withdrawn from the from the permanent fund earnings reserve. Well, and I think they I think what happened was 
they felt still, I mean, the PFD has always been the political third rail of Alaskan politics. And I think that they felt the heat over the last two years in touching the PFD. And they understood that if they fundamentally and permanently changed it, it, there was going to be a hell storm that was going to come after that. And they would probably all be swept up with it. This is their way of trying to split the baby uh, get part of what they want while still coddling or at least projecting to the to the uh, constituency that they're really not after your PFD. When in fact, as you point out, next year they're going to have to cut into it again because the forty percent is just not going to be enough. Yeah, you, you see statements by Senator Costello and Senator Machecki and some in the House that say, uh, "Oh, we, we we preserved your PFD. We didn't change the PFD statute. We preserved your PFD." Uh, and so, and so, you can't campaign against this on uh, because we preserve the existing statute. We voted to to reaffirm uh, the existing statute by not changing it. Well, that's just wrong. I mean, they've created a situation in which there's not going to be enough money in the box to do both the PFD and uh, uh, and fund government in in the fashion that that even their own projections say they are. So they they haven't they haven't preserved the PFD. They've just kicked the can down the road. Uh, for making that decision to another day, but they've set up a situation in which the PFD uh, is is clearly at risk. So, yeah, they may say that. Uh, they may claim that they preserve the PFD, uh, but they but but they haven't. They've just set up a, a an untenable uh, and to some degree confusing situation about what comes next. SB twenty six comes in at number four. We were sure I was sure that it was going to be number one for sure. Uh, but, uh, of course with three thirty one kind of kicking everything else around that it did drop down, which takes us on to the fifth of the five most fiscally irresponsible votes this season. Brad, where do we go? All right. That's, that's the Senate vote on SB one forty two, which was the capital budget. And the reason that I'm, that, that, that it makes the list is because the Senate intentionally, they knew what they were doing intentionally short paid uh, the Medicaid providers this, this the, the remainder of this fiscal year. They needed about $40 million more in Medicaid funding because the Senate had done the same thing last year. They short paid Medicaid last year. And so a bunch of the money that, that otherwise was supposed to be allocated to Medicaid this year got consumed paying off the previous year's uh, Medicaid payments. Well, rather than fix that, rather than step up to the plate and say, yep, we got to fix this, we got to fully fund, uh, the Senate left uh, made it Medicaid um, uh, short funded and 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 now has set up the same situation where in in, in the last part of the year, sort of June uh, time frame, there's not going to be enough money uh, in the bucket to pay off the Medicaid state current with the Medicaid providers. So the Medicaid providers are going to have to stretch out their lives. They're going to have these accounts receivable that that, are, that the state's not going to satisfy, and then they'll get a bunch of money at the first of next year, uh, and, and we've kicked this, we've kicked the same problem down the road to the next year. If for for people who went around, for people in the Senate who went around saying, "Oh, we have to do HB 331 because we owe this money to the oil producers, uh, and we need to go out, we need to bond because we owe this money." Of course, we don't. Statute doesn't provide that. But for people who went around high and mighty saying that sort of thing, to then turn around and intentionally, knowingly uh, short, pre- short pay uh, Medicaid providers, uh, I, think is, I, I think is just, is just totally ir- irresponsible um, and unacceptable fiscal behavior. Um, it's not so much, uh, it's not so much the, the, the fact they're, they're, it's Medicaid they picked on. I think we need to reform Medicaid. I think we need to reduce the number of options the state's in on Medicaid. But as long as we have them, as long as you're not going to change that, we at least need to pay the people who are providing uh, those services. Those are debts the state owes, uh, and we need we need to stay current on those. Right. Sort of adding to that, a- adding to that sort of insult to injury in SB 142, not only did the Senate intentionally short pay uh, Medicaid providers, but then they partially restored funding for the Arm Bridge uh, and for the Juno Access Road, two things, two projects that are that are as dead as you possibly can find uh, in this day. Two capital projects that are dead. The the dollars they added back in are, are, aren't even close to being enough to build these projects. They're just going to enable them to go out and contract with another contractor to do another study 
uh, or to do a little bit more testing is basically what the state's doing. So they've, they've, they've taken these funds, they've underfunded, underfunded Medicaid providers, uh, underfunded the state's obligations, diverted those funds uh, basically over to certain contractors that uh, that they want to favor to to do little projects around Connect Arm Bridge and, and Juno Access. I, for 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 people who go around, walked around, and said, "You got to pay. The state's got to pay its debts." Just absolutely irresponsible behavior. Well, and again, this is par for the course because they will intentionally underfund specific things, which they know. They will have to pay when the fiscal clock ticks over. They know they'll have to pay it on July 1. They know. I mean, they had a supplemental Medicaid bill when they started the session this year of $100 million in part because they short-funded Medicaid last year and then could pat themselves on the back saying, look, we saved $100 million, not saying that they just kicked it until the clock ticked over into the next into the next pay period. And, and that's exactly what they're doing here. And as you said, to short pay people who are not big oil companies, who don't have lenders who are like being patient, waiting for that money to show up, but are day-to-day doctors and, and who are providing a service, expecting to be paid in 30 days, and now have to wait 45, 60, 90, 120 days to get paid, um, it, it puts a tremendous hardship on them, all for the sake of being able to say, we saved $20 million. Oh, wait, no, we didn't. Now it's just due next year instead of this year. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, rather than man up uh, or woman up, whatever the, the right phrase is these days, rather, rather than then face up to the to the op, to, to to the situation we're in, saying we're going to go in and look at these Medicaid. We don't like as much. We don't like how much we're spending on Medicaid. We're going to go in and look at these Medicaid programs, and we're going to eliminate some of the optional services to to eliminate costs because we've got to get the cost down to what we can afford. Rather than face up to that, go in and do that. Uh, and make make the decisions necessary to bring those costs down on a real time basis. They're sort of living in a fairyland, saying, "Well, we'll just short pay, and it'll look like we're paying less for for Medicaid costs." And you know, maybe maybe by doing that, we'll force somebody to actually find some cost savings. Well, no, the programs cost what they cost. That there's there's a problem with these programs uh, uh, because they cost a lot. And the way to solve that pro- that problem is to go in and cut some of the optional services. It's not to it's not to short pay the people who, in good faith, are providing those services as long as long as they're on the statute books. Just uh, it, it for 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 a body who went around saying, you know, we owe these costs of oil producers, we need to pay these costs to oil producers. We're even going to go out and borrow and incur more costs to pay these costs that to oil producers for a body that went around a large part of the session and said that to then come at the end and short pay the Medicaid providers. is just, uh, it, it, it's just, it, 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 it's irresponsible. I, that's, that's the word I've chosen to, to use for this. I, I could use others, but it's just irresponsible. Well, and I'll use words. Cowardly is the word that I would use because, again, like you said, they would have to man up. They would have to own up to what has happened in the legislature over the last 20 years and basically say, oh, hey, we're the ones that are responsible for this. And if we were going to be responsible, we would fix it. But we're really not into that. We're into just kind of kicking it down the road. And, you know, we're only several of us are are just a few years away from retirement. So we'll go for one more round and then we'll retire on our pensions and do all this stuff. And we'll be happy little clams. That's what's going on right now, in my opinion, in the legislature. And it's one of the prime reasons why we've got to change everything that's going on down there so those are your top five go ahead i'm sorry you can respond to that go ahead no that, we're going to be talking on subsequent programs about about what we do about these top five the, the purpose here was just to was just to really sort of sum up the top five so we've got this baseline as we as we talk about why we need to change players down the road yeah no absolutely we've got to do that which again leads us down now to our wrap up um so now we have the top five Most fiscally irresponsible votes this session. You could take a look at them. They're up on the screen right now. One through five, the worst through the least worst, but they're all bad. uh, And they're all painful for Alaskans. And they all show, again, a distinct lack of courage on the part of our legislators in passing these bills. And, uh, And that's a real crisis. And it's a real shame that we've gotten some people who... 
like I said earlier, heretofore have been pretty stalwart defenders of smaller government who have gotten sucked up into the uh, into the fervor and the peer pressure of voting on some of these bills, especially the first one, which is HB 331. So, Brad, these five things being out there right now, people are I mean, we're frustrated. We are absolutely frustrated. There's no two ways about it. What do we do? How do we, you know, what do we, what's the next step now that session's over, now that this is going on, what is the next step to try and take back our government in this regard? Oh, we got to change the players, Michael. I mean, th- this is what you get. We now know what we get with this governor and with, with these legislatures. Uh, and it's not like, there's not like any pure, pure of heart uh, body that we can go to. I mean, the House Republicans are the ones that did 330 that, that voted for 331 provided the the margin of error for or the margin of victory for 331 uh, on the house side. So you can't just say Republicans are better let's go vote for Republicans. Uh, you've got to go in and look at these individuals. And so in 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 races like uh, down on the Kenai where you got Ron Gillum opposing running against Peter Macecki for uh, the Senate two Republicans, it'll make a difference which Republican you elect. Right. Uh, Macheki is part of the problem, part of the part of the part of the the leadership that led to 331 and led to all these things uh, on this list. It makes a difference uh, uh, whether he stays or goes. So, what we do now is we go in and we start looking at the players. I'm going to do a scorecard off of this list and show who voted for what. Um, we go in and start looking at the players and decide, you know, where change needs to happen and where change can happen, where people have stepped up. Uh, to run against the incumbents in these in these areas, so it, it'll be it, we we now shift over. Now that we know what they've done, now that we know how they voted, it's shifting over to changing the players. It's going to be interesting because in the races where they're Republicans versus Republicans, as you point out, Ron Gillum, Peter Machicki, uh Sarah Vance versus Paul Seaton. Uh, some of these races, it will be pretty cut and dried as to who the candidates should be. But then we get into races, for example, like Pete Kelly versus Scott Kawasaki, Republican versus a Democrat, but a Republican who is in favor of bailing out the oil companies versus a Democrat who spoke out against HB 331 and said, this doesn't make any sense to do it. And so people are going to be conflicted. I mean, does it come down to a race of party ideology or is it a race to basically just say, let's put somebody new in the seat almost regardless of their party affiliation, just new blood. Not that Scott Kawasaki per se is new blood, but there will be other races like that out there, I think. There are going to be a lot of races like that. I mean, uh, Sharice Millette's race against whichever Higgins is running this time, Patty or Pat, uh, is going to be a race like that. I mean, she voted for HB 331. She was part, she was, she was the leader of the, of the Republicans in the, in the house, uh, that voted uh, in bulk to, to to move uh, to move 331 forward. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be some races where you know you're going to make tough choices. I know that there are going to be people out there uh, that say, well, the Republicans are better than the Democrats, so you got to you know you got to hold your nose and vote Republican. But that's how we got Kathy Geisel and and John Coghill back in the legislature uh, uh, this session. So I. We're, we're gonna, I'm going to take these uh, uh, one by one and sort of look at how people come out on this on this scorecard, how they've come out on past scorecards, and sort of you know do an analysis of of, of each of each of those races. Some are going to be clear. Gillum against Machecki's clear. You're right. Sarah Vance against against uh, Representative Seaton. Seaton's going to be clear. Uh, some of them are going to be less clear, but but nevertheless, uh, I think there's going to be uh, at least in my mind. Uh, some pretty strong reasons for change uh, in some of these in some of these races. Change the players, change the venues, change the rules. No binding caucus, no open, no closed meetings, no conflict of interest, and change the funding for the state. I think those have to be our mantra, Brad, for everything that we're doing for the coming years moving forward in the state of Alaska. Yep, yep, I agree, Michael. Yep. I, I, we know where we're going. We know where we're going if we keep going down. Uh, uh, down this road. So, um, 
it, it, the only way we're going to change it is change the players. And it's got to happen. And if we can't do it now, when 50 of the 60 are up for re-election, we ain't never going to get it done. We've got to put somebody in every one of those races to at least challenge the incumbent. If if nothing else, putting a challenger up against an incumbency holds them responsible for every vote that they've taken this last session. And so they could be called out for every one of those votes. Uh, we need everybody to step up in these different races and do that. That 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 is critical at this point to get it done. Yep. All right, Brad Keithley. Folks, want to find out more, Brad? Uh, websites, Facebook pages, what do we do? I think the best thing is to go to the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, uh, Facebook page. We sort of uh, funnel everything, all of the Twitter comments and everything else is funneled through that page, and it's sort of – it's sort of right there on one page. You can you can page down and see what we've been saying. So I would I would urge people to go and join, uh, a like, and follow uh, the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, Facebook page. And that link is right here on the Facebook. If you're watching the stream, it's at the top of the page in the description. You can see Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is highlighted. Just click on that link, and you will be taken right to the page. Not right now. Do it after the show so we don't lose you on the feed. <laughs> Brad Keithley, uh, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. My friend, thank you so much for your thoughtful analysis. As always, please don't move to Oregon. I can't do this without you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm not moving to Oregon. <laughs> Who wants to live in Oregon anyway? Good God. Of all the places. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate you coming in on the Michael Duke Show. Thanks as always, Michael. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.